Welcome to the Trade Show Podcast, the home for conversations with the movers and shakers of the $50 billion trade show industry. This show will bring you face to face with experts and speak to them about the past, present and the future of the trade show and event industry. Through these conversations, we hope to bring you insights that will help you get the most out of your investments in your trade show participations. I am your host, Shubhanjan Sarkar, founder of Pitchlink, the next generation visitor engagement platform where our mission is to make buying easy. Welcome to this very special episode of the Trade Show Podcast. Today we have with us David Dubois, the CEO and President of Exhibitor Group and publisher of Exhibitor Magazine. You always want to grow a show, right? You want to get more exhibitors, more sponsors, more attendees. You want to increase the commerce that happens within a, a trade fair, or trade show, exhibition. But you know what? You know that the market, you know that the market is five times larger than what you're attracting. How do you get more people? Through technology. So if you're not doing video work at your show, capturing the experiences, doing testimonial interviews, shame on you as a show organizer. And flip it, shame on you as an exhibitor. David Dubois is the CEO and president of Exhibitor Group and publisher of Exhibitor Magazine. Dubois manages 20 staff members who produce the annual Exhibitor Live exhibition and educational program, oversees Exhibitor Magazine, and supports the Certified Trade Show Marketer CTSM program. Before coming to Exhibitor Group, David served as President and CEO of the International Association of Exhibitions and Events, as well as Co-President of Exhibitions and Conferences Alliance. In 2019, David was inducted into the Events Industry Council's Hall of Leaders, one of the industry's most prestigious honors. He also served as the COO at Meeting Professionals International MPI from 1996 to 2000. During this time, he supported programs and services for more than 16,000 members worldwide and served as the Executive Vice President of the MPI Foundation. His more than 45 years of hospitality exhibitions and business events experience contributes to the enhanced growth and successes of the global industry. Now, on to this insightful episode with David Dubois. David, welcome to the Trade Show Podcast. I'm more than delighted to have you here because these are serious learning opportunities because the amount you have seen in the trade show business, I don't think there are many people who can claim to have seen the same. So... <laughs> Uh, it's 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 a really an honor and and I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Thanks for coming. Uh, it is my pleasure and um, uh, I know it's hard to see on the screen, but if I go to the side, that's a lot of a uh, lot of gray hair that uh, I've accumulated in almost 50 years of working in the hospitality, exhibitions, and business events industry. But uh, I'm still plugging away, and it's a pleasure to support and help. Uh, grow our global exhibition and events industry. So let's dive right in. Uh, from the position that you are in today, where do you say the industry is today? What is the state of the industry today? Well, once again, thank you for having me on and uh, look forward to our conversation. Uh, when I was in the hotel business, uh, I refer to it this way as many, many minutes ago, uh, I work for Sheraton Hotels and Ritz-Carlton Hotels in the United States. I, by the way, I'm based in Dallas, Texas, USA. And um, I remember when the uh, when the Internet was exploding and uh, all of a sudden there uh, was the fear in the hotel industry that, my goodness, face-to-face -face meetings are going to go away because technology is going to take over. Well, you know, we keep going through these cycles. I refer to them as uh, kind of a roller coaster rides of technology in and out. But technology, as I'm sure we'll touch on, is um, continues to be critically important to what we do in the face-to-face -face business events world. That's kind of the generic way I, I refer to it. But, uh, you know, 2019 truly was the best financial economic impact year of the global business events industry. 
Our goal is to try to get back to that, but I think that might be difficult because people got used to the kind of technologies that we're on right now, uh, replacing maybe five to 10% of what they used to do in person because you used to get on an airplane, right? And go see uh, person A or person B to conduct business or make a sales pitch or, you know, now obviously people still go to trade shows, exhibitions, trade fairs, but uh, what we do, uh, what we're doing right now, obviously, is, is uh, you know, we could spend a couple hours. Uh, it's not fun, but it's a couple. Well, with you it is, but it, it, it's not fun to to uh, to sit on. I was on a, a, a uh, in a meeting for five hours uh, two weeks ago, and yes, we got a break every hour for ten minutes. But it's brutal. I would rather have gotten on an airplane, spent a night in a hotel. But then again, it would have cost fifteen hundred, two thousand U.S. dollars to do that. So it was much more efficient for eight of us to be on a on a Teams or a Zoom or a Riverside call. So, but twenty nineteen is uh, was the best year ever. Uh, COVID then impacted all of us around the world, no matter where you were, unless you were uh, a squirrel underground looking for for nuts, you were negatively impacted. But I can tell you that in twenty twenty four. Uh, we're about 93 to 95% back to the level levels of 2019. And I'll stop there and just let you know that business events, meetings, conventions, trade shows, exhibitions, trade fairs, however you label it, um, will never go away. And we are augment, augmented. A lot of people don't like it when I say this. We are positively augmented by technology. And I'll tell you in a few minutes about why, how, how, how important that is. Yeah, just one side question on this one. Uh, I believe that there's a lot of talk. If you're if you're if you're sort of tracking the sales tech and the sales industry, the, the sales uh, function in in business, you know that there's a lot of discussion about intent. You know, identifying a person with intent so that you can sell to him. And that's a very critical thing. I mean, it's it's not trivial at all. Uh, if I know that you are looking for something, it's much easier to sell to you than try to knock hundreds of people to find you out, right? And trade shows, by definition, the B2B trade shows, come with intent. If I'm not interested in that trade show, I'm not going to go there. I'm actually making a serious commitment as a visitor to go there. And yet, we are challenged with defining ROI when people are participating. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, you've hit it right on. You've hit, as they say, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, if you're a chief executive officer of a company, Company X based in London, Company X based in Delhi, Company X based in New York City, wherever it is, you and your CFO have the fiduciary responsibility to make sure that every dollar that is spent is driving top line revenue, which then flows to bottom line profit. So more and more, there is an absolute focus and demand for exhibitors and sponsors who, who consider uh, business to business or bi even business to consumer trade show engagements that they say to the show organizer, the business event organizer, they say to, to, to he or she, show me how I can measure, quantify, and give in a reasonable period of time, three months after the show, six months after the show, because as you said, the, the, the sales funnel and the sales process is you don't meet you know, person A on a Wednesday at a trade show, and by Friday you have a signed contract. It just does oh, every so often that happens, but eh, maybe one percent of the time. <laughs> and then you and then you have one heck of a party, right? Uh, hey, it's the best trade show I ever went to, and I can't wait to sign up again. So I'll I'll, I'll kind of complete my thought by saying it's critically important. But then again, the show organizer, which I. I've done for the last 15 years of my life on the show organizer because the exhibitor group has a show called Exhibitor Live every spring. 
And then at IE, International Association of Exhibitions Events, where I was for 11 years, we had a show, and they still do, of course, every December. Um, so as a show organizer, you say, okay, what sh- send me your pre-show plan, marketing outreach plan. Send me your in-person engagement theories, tactics, gatherings. And by the way, what's your post event, business event show plan? So when the exhibitor wants the show organizer to prove uh, measurement and ROI, flip that. And once again, I'm agnostic, right? <laughs> flip that uh, to say, okay, exhibitor, what are you doing? You just don't show up with a pretty face and a nice new dress and business suit and, co- and business cards and we, what we call trinkets and trash, little giveaways at your booth, at your stand, and say, I'm here. You got to work it. So I'll stop there because you can see I get passionate about it. No, no. I think I think this this is this is critical because one of the things uh, Paul had mentioned, and I would uh, and I would like your thoughts on it, uh, is that it, it is surprising how slow and how little follow up is done with the booth visitors. Somebody is walking to your booth, spending fifteen minutes of your time, unless you have really qual- disqualified the person. That's fine. That this is he's not a buyer. It's fine. I mean, you should still engage with him, but we can go there later. But the ones we show interest, the the, so so what's really going on with the exhibitor there? Well, I gave you a perfect example. Once again, you hit it, you hit the nail on the head. I was at a meeting last week in Washington D.C., and it wasn't a trade show, but it was a gathering of 150 to 200 ladies and gentlemen in my industry. And um, because we have an exhibitor live trade show every spring. We have a magazine that goes to 20,000 and I come out of sales and marketing. Once you're in sales marketing, you never leave. And if you've never been in sales marketing, you better be in sales and marketing. <laughs> Absolutely. Because if you don't drive the top line, your owner is going to say goodbye to you. So at the end of the day, that's that's what I'm all about. I, w- I went to my room about 10 p.m. after the first night. I met six new people. We exchanged business cards. We said hello. We maybe had a glass of wine or, or, or an ice water, whatever whatever the beverage of choice was. Before I go go to bed at any event, I get my laptop out for an hour. I put the business cards on and I say, hey, I sent an email. So nice to meet you. Let's catch up in the next couple of weeks. Um and I don't say this, but whether we're going to do business together or not, I just made a new friend in the industry. So for 48 years, yes, I'm old, for 48 years, I built a Rolodex. Remember the days when you had a Rolodex? Where you, yes, yes. You stapled the cards and it was, it was <laughs> you had this big old Rolodex. Now it's all on our computers, right? Yeah. And I have more acquaintances that I've met over the years that I've never done business with, but I, I will see person A or person B at a show or an event, and he or she and I would would say, hey, you know, remind me of your name. Where did Remind me where we met. It's all about those personal relationships. So, you know, um, shame on the exhibitors who don't follow up. You know what? I told an exhibitor that said they had a lousy show uh, this past um, um, February when we were in Nashville, Tennessee for our show, Exhibitor Live. And I got on with the sales manager, my sales manager and th- this exhibitor. And he was complaining the whole time. And I asked him, what did you do before, during, and after? And help me understand what your plans were. And he just went on and on. I said, you know what? I appreciate the fact that you've been in, you, it's the first time in your show. First of all, if you go to a show once and you don't do it right, shame on you. And I actually said to him, I said, I guess this isn't the right fit. We thank you for being with us this year. I hope I hope you come back. If not, take care and have a good day. I followed up with an email, never heard from the guy again. And that's fine. They're making a business decision. Sure. But don't put it all on the show organizer. And and the show organizer should not put it all on the exhibitors. It's, it's a two-way street. 
Yeah. Uh, one quick anecdotal question. You sent out, I'm guessing, 20, 30 mails that night? Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the show. If I go to... No, uh, this one. The one you, you mentioned, that, that meeting you went to about 150 people. Oh, no. I had seven or eight. Seven or eight. How seven many mails eight. did you get? Uh, I got three replies. No. How many people wrote to you? Nobody. Exactly. Exactly my point. And by the way, these were not all people that were prospects for buying a booth or stand or be a sponsor at my show or buy ads in my magazine. Yeah. They were just acquaintances I made for the first time. Yeah. 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 And you know what? Hmm. Back in the hotel business, I sat on a committee. I sat next to an association executive meeting professional, meeting planner, and got to know her. And her son's name was Seth. And this was 35 years ago. She just connected with me on Facebook recently. Her son, you know, is married with a couple of kids. She's a grandmother. And six weeks or six months after I sat in a committee meeting with her for our industry in Washington, D.C. when I was in the hotel business, she called me and booked a big convention. And she wasn't even my, my account. <laughs> but trust me, I went to the director of sales and I said, this is now my account because nobody's called on her, Deborah Tucker, for years. And you never know. You yeah, never know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I agree. And, and by the way, if you just, again, as an, as an aside, you know how many people write to you every day on LinkedIn to connect with you? Right? Uh, sure. I, get, I, I get maybe 20 requests every day to sure. connect. And I do connect with, say, five of them. Yeah, if they're in the and, industry, yeah. Right? Or and in the business world. In the business world, five of them I connect with when once they have approached me, out of those five, not one write back to me, because I typically write them, I'm, I'm happy to connect, tell me what can I do for you. Right? Sure. In a month of the 150 I've connected with because of their requested to me, maybe five will write back. 145 don't. I don't know your experience, but that's my experience. Well, you know, if you had sent me a LinkedIn request, um, I may not have responded. But when you said Paul Woodward, who's a colleague of mine for 15 years, recommended that we connect, how quickly did I respond? Okay, Absolutely. I yeah, you're yeah. a trusted person now. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. So, so, so David, let's let's shift gear a bit and let's talk about technology. How you see the technology landscape for the trade show uh, industry changing, and and your thoughts and ideas about it. Very good. And let me speak at, on a global level. I know that uh, you're in Bangalore today. You you spent a lot of time in Toronto. I've had the pleasure of having incredible experiences and still have good friends from my uh, from my 11 years at IAE, uh, you know, across the great country of India. Um, so, and we talked about that uh, before we got online. Basically, what what I think technology, not what I think, what I know technology does is okay. Let's say you have a trade show in the logistics business in Bangalore, or you have it in uh, Shanghai, or you have it in Dallas, where I live. Doesn't matter where it is. And it's a global opportunity. And typically, in 2019, you got 18,000 individuals. The peak of the show, the peak of the logistics industry, from 27 countries, making up numbers. And, uh, you always want to grow a show, right? You want to get more exhibitors, more sponsors, more attendees. You want to increase the commerce that happens within a, a trade fair, or trade show, exhibition. But you know what? You know that the market, you know that the market is five times larger than what you're attracting. How do you get more people? Through technology. So if you're not doing video work at your show, capturing the experiences, doing testimonial interviews, 
shame on you as a show organizer. And flip it, shame on you as an exhibitor. If I'm an exhibitor at a big show in Bangalore and or in Shanghai, as I mentioned, as examples, I would want to hire a videographer to follow me around, to promote my product or service and post it, hey, live from the Logistics Expo, um, March 27th, look what we've done and, and take technology and use it through social media opportunities, whether it's LinkedIn or all, any, all of the other, you know, WhatsApp application, you know, et cetera, WeChats all over the world. Now through technology, you're touching and expanding and potentially uh, attracting more people through technology. Guess what? If a thousand people watch your video and you get 10 say to their bosses, I got to go to that show. Never heard of it before. That's what technology does to augment your market share and your market penetration and your new um, acquisition efforts. The face-to-face -face is super critical. There's no two ways about it. But where do you think virtual events fit in in this scope of things? Now that things are back to 95% normal. You know, vir virtual events are good as long as they are short and provide great quality content. Um, we do two 45-minute, what we call e-tracks, um, e-learning for our community, which is focused as the exhibitor group on exhibitors 95% of what we do is exhibitor training, exhibitor certification, exhibitor ROI, measurement, etc. So we do two of those a month. And we average sometimes um, 60. Uh, and we charge minimal, like $25 US, not, nothing, nothing big. But they need to be 30 to 45 minutes. They need to be uh, very quality focused. They need to not bore you after 10 minutes where you click off, even if you paid 25 euros or $25 or whatever. Um, so we see that that webinars, podcasts like this are very important to, um, from a learning perspective, a content sharing perspective, and as I said earlier, a marketplace uh, engagement and attraction strategies because you're exposing yourself to anybody. I mean, watching this, when you launch it, there could be people from 60 countries that access it because I know you have that kind of following. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for a short break. Stay with us. After the break. You know, if you see, if you see a show like CES Comdex, which is in Las Vegas yeah. every January, 200,000, 180,000 people. They would not, and I saw Gary Shapiro, the CEO last week, they would not even think about having an online show ever again. But guess what? They had to for two years. So I'm not a big fan, um, but it, it could work and probably does for some show organizers who augment um, and maybe provide to the in-person exhibitor an opportunity for an online capability, more of a marketplace, but it can't be live. It would have to be you know, um, accessible and appointment making opportunities. You are listening to a Biscast audio original. Podcasting is one of the fastest growing content marketing avenues today. We can help you exploit this largely untapped marketing opportunity. We can craft your audio strategy and leverage the wide reach and easy streaming capability that smartphone penetration provides. It is powerful and personal. Talk to us to find out how podcasting can help you build your brand and reach out to target audiences. Welcome back. I'm Shubhanjan Sarkar, your host for the Trade Show Podcast and founder of Pitchling, the visitor engagement platform. Let's dive back into the episode with Paul Woodward. What about, what about events which are not webinar, but more like actually 
virtual booths and stuff like that. Do you see that working anymore? Well, I'm going to be very direct and honest and probably won't make some people happy who are watching this or listening to. Virtual trade shows are awful. They're awful. They're, you know, it's, let me walk down a, an animated AI generated uh, exhibit hall floor, knock on somebody's door and hope that there's a sales rep that, you know, might be online at the same time. Or maybe I send a request for, for an appointment. I think they're awful. I'm a, I'm a face to face guy. And I'll just be honest with you. Did they have to take place during COVID? There was no other choice. For three years-ish, depending on where you live, I know that uh, India was uh, tightly closed down for a long time. Certainly China was, a lot of Asia. Uh, Europe and the United States, South Latin America kind of came on a little bit quicker, et cetera. So we had to do it. But now, if I'm a show organizer, I... I'm a show organizer. I, I have 100, 150 uh, stands at my show, uh, 2,500 attendees. Um, you know, if you see if you see a show like CES Comdex, which is in Las Vegas yeah. every January, 200,000, 180,000 people, they would not. And I saw Gary Shapiro, the CEO, last week. They would not even think about having an online show ever again. Right. But guess what? Right. They had to for two years. Yeah. So I'm not a big fan, um, mm. but it it could work and probably does for some show organizers who augment um, and maybe provide to the in-person exhibitor an opportunity for an online capability, more of a marketplace, but it can't be live. It would have to be, you know, um, accessible and appointment making opportunities. Yeah, I, I agree. By the way, I mean, I attended uh, CES multiple times, but uh, in the late 2010s. Sure. Uh, and uh, I met Gary Shapiro a couple of times. I had the, had the opportunity. I'm, I'm sure I, I'm sure he doesn't remember me by, by any stretch. But that, that story for another day, I can tell you why what I was doing there. But uh, yes, I have been and I know I know exactly what you're talking about. Just one quick thought before we let this go. Uh, do you think that virtual events can actually play a very important role post event? So what I'm saying is there is a there is a live event, which is like you suggested, 150 stands, say 3000 or 5000 or 10,000 uh, visitors and so on. Now, the visitors have visited, say, 40 stands out of the 150 and and he goes back and there is a possibility he doesn't remember all of it. But there is a virtual place you can go back to and say, okay, okay, these are the th stands I went to and and maybe set up an appointment. I mean, I understand people cannot possibly have one person or a bunch of people attending sure. a virtual booth all their lives. That's not feasible. But but the rest of it, possibly. Do, do, do you see there is a play there at all? Yes, I do. You know, as I was very negative and honest about my opinion about um, uh, online trade shows. I think after the fact where you provide 150 stands, exhibitors, as the example, the opportunity to still have a presence for, call it even three months, as a value added, no extra cost, and you promote it we would promote it for my show, for example, to our, our buyer attendees or at CES to the 180, 200,000 folks to go in and look at and still have access to for, let's say, 90 days, uh, free of charge, um, the opportunity to connect because, you know what, CES as the example or any big show that happens in Bangalore, Delhi, Shanghai, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You can't get to every stand. It's impossible. My my son worked for uh, Procter and Gamble, and uh, he was sent to a show. He was sent to the CEO show eight nine years ago by his boss. He called me. He says, "Dad, you're in this business. What do I do?" And I said, "You draft up your your ad objectives for the show. First of all, you get an appointment with your boss." happened to be a, an outstanding woman he loved working for. 
and you say, what are your objectives? You're going to spend $3,000 sending me to this show for three days because you want me to come back to Procter & Gamble with new ideas and potential, you know, uh, marketing partners or social media partners because he's in the marketing world. And um, he did that and he came back and said, you know what? His boss said, nobody's ever asked. She's, she's never been asked by anybody she's sending to a show for this. I said, good, you need a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> My point is that, you know, to be able to go in to answer your question, to be able to go in at the, at the end of the show and still have 90 days or so access, it's a great value added to the exhibitor, great value added to the attendees. So I support it 100%. That, that, that's that's a nice uh, nice feedback because this is something which I think about. Uh, how do we make trade shows more effective in terms of the ability? Like you said, I mean, I go to 40 stands. I have left out 110. Maybe there was something interesting, but I missed it. But there's an opportunity that over a few weeks, I can keep going there and keep connecting with people. Before before I move to, uh, uh, to the next topic in my mind, I, I would want to know, since you're focused on exhibitors, uh, how large do you think is the pool of exhibitors, say North America or globally? I mean, you have been in with IAE, you have, you know, Paul, Ufi, what are your guesstimates? Well, there's a, uh, there's an organization that I had the pleasure of, of partnering with and overseeing called the Center for Exhibition Industry Research, CEIR.org. That was a little uh, if I was still working for them, I, I would call a selfless plug, but I'm not. <laughs> it, it, uh, Ufi has uh, Ufi has great um, research as well as SEER. Those are the two leading research organizations on a, on a global basis. SEER is more U.S. centric, and Ufi is uh, more global. Um, but the latest information from the SEER research is it is estimated in the United States alone. Almost 800,000 companies exhibit at at least one trade show a year. Let me repeat that. 800,000 companies, and it could be a company that sells widgets based in Des Moines, Iowa, or sure. a company that is global that comes in from, uh, from London or Frankfurt to sell their products or services. But I'm talking about just U.S. companies, 800,000. Wow. So if you think about that, and I, I, I saw Kai Haddendorf who, who uh, recently, and he, uh, uh, he replaced Paul Woodward when Paul retired. Hmm. And, you know, I always, want, I, and I always forget to ask him the question, what does Ufi think in terms of how many exhibiting companies? What's your research said? I've never asked him. But in the hmm. U.S. alone, Sears says there's about 800,000. Guess what? 800,000. My boss, my owner, Mark Johnson, said, what's the marketplace for Exhibitor Live? I said, 800,000 companies sending one attendee. We couldn't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, oh, I'd find a way. <laughs> <laughs> but my yeah. point is, it's yeah. huge. It's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's just, a, that's just the United States. Right, right. Yeah. So, so to to move to the next phase of my questions, I mean, I mean, I I may have some other questions about stats, but not necessarily. We need to talk about it now. Uh, what do you see are the biggest challenges that exhibitors are facing today? So let's talk from the exhibitors' point of view, and because that's where you are most active at this point, and and you are talking to them every day, and you are and you're hearing them. I mean, ROI was one of the points that we discussed. What else? Is the is the is is the biggest challenge that you see uh, in front of the exhibitors? Well, you know, as we great question. As we came out of COVID a couple of years ago, um, inflation went crazy. It's starting to settle down. I know in the United States, the the federal government has a target of um, a little over two percent, which I think is is um, um, not going to be achievable. We're at 2.7%, which is pretty good in the United States. And yeah. I don't know what it's like uh, statistically around the world, India, Canada, Europe. Um, but we're doing okay in the States, for example. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's the cost of living. It's, uh, it's inflation. 
So think about it this way. If you're an exhibitor and you're based in in uh, Dubai and you have a stand that needs to be shipped to Delhi or to Las Vegas for a show um, and you sent the same stand, maybe it was 30 meters, you know, 20 by 20 meters, whatever the size was. And you sent it to the show you go to every year in Delhi or Las Vegas or New York. In 2024, it's 25% more expensive to, to ship it. Yeah. So do you go to less shows? Mm. Do you make your stand smaller? Do you make it more lightweight? Do you hire a company in Las Vegas, New York, uh, Bangalore, wherever, to build a stand for you and store it because you go every year? Mm. Costs are very difficult to keep under control because inflation is inflation. And I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm an independent voter in the United States. Whether a, a president of the United States or, or a prime minister in India, I don't care who he or she is, they're not in charge of the economy. People think yeah. they are, but they're not. So if President A or Prime Minister B in a certain city or country, um, you know, is, is uh, charged with trying to keep inflation down, inflation happens because economies supply and demand happens. Anyways, I'll stop there because I could get going. But I'll leave, I'll leave you with this summary is cost containment and cost. We have less exhibitors in 2024 than we had in 2019 because they're going to one or maybe a half less show on average. And the cost continue to creep up. Yeah. A return on investment, measurement and cost. Yeah, and which is why, again, as as exhibitors, not 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 as exhibitors, but but show organizers, I think there is some amount of responsibility in our at least creating a framework for ROI. Correct for for the exhibitors, because finally they are our customers. Uh, if if we are the show organizer, if I'm an exhibitor, 100%. my customer is somebody else who is coming walking into my show. But but for the but the show organizers, I think giving a path to ROI becomes very, very critical component over here. And, you know, and, you know, the attendees who are the customers and prospects of the exhibitors, they want to make sure that when they go to city A or city B, that they get reasonable room rates. Yeah. Room rates have gone through the roof around the world. You go to city A or city B. I'm always careful about not picking on a city. <laughs> if you go to city A or city B or city uh, X, and you can't find a, a room in a decent metropolitan city and a, a, call it a three-star property for under 300 euros yeah. or $300. Um, you may only go for two nights instead of three nights, and it's a three-day show. Yeah. What does that do? That means an attendee only walks the show for two days versus three days. How awful is the last day of every show you've ever attended? Yeah. Fifty percent. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if the show is supposed to end at six, I have seen people pack up at two o'clock. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, the cost of venues, I believe, has gone up significantly. Correct. Also, putting pressure on the on the on the cost structure. Uh, and I, I think it's it's important that the the venue owners and the show owners sit together and and have have. Uh, a, a, a reasonable conversation uh, because because if if finally I stop doing a show in wherever Las Vegas or Bangalore doesn't matter the venue gets nothing right yes so so we, we, we need to be I mean cognizant of the realities of the of the both the visitors and the exhibitor and it, you touch on venues I can tell you without naming a country there, there are several countries, and during my 11 years at IAEE, the International Association of Exhibitions and Events, as their CEO, 
I was probably, I probably traveled to 15, 17 countries. Half of them have too many exhibition centers that run less than 50% occupancy. So they, when they do get a group in, they've got to maximize their revenues on rental and food and beverage and services and audiovisual and catering. Um, it drives up the inflation numbers. So um, once again, supply and demand. Anybody, any later gentlemen in business understand if you if you took any any sort of economics econ class, how supply and demand drives pricing, and there's a balance. Um, so you got to look at. I was looking at it as as a as a as a stool of four prongs. You've got the show organizers, you've got the attendees, you've got the suppliers, AV companies, catering companies, venues, convention centers, etc., and you have the exhibitors. So my current job, we focus on the exhibitors, but if any of those four legs of a stool are are shaky or weak, or too darn expensive, everybody loses. Absolutely. Got to have a balance. Absolutely. Um, I want to bring you back to one of the points you mentioned uh, is uh, related to the workforce development. Yes. And I, I, I want you to talk about that as well, because I think it's a very, very critical component of what's going on and, and how it's going to impact the industry over the next at least a few years. Well, thank you for that question. We did uh, uh, kind of touch on it earlier uh, before we got on this uh, this chat with each other. Uh, workforce development is probably top one, two, or three, whether you're an exhibitor, whether you're an attendee, because right now in the United States, as, as that's the research I have most access to, approximately 50% of the employees that are taking good care of exhibitions, business events, meetings, conventions at hotels or convention centers or general service contractors, the ones who help build the stands, um, are brand new because we lost 50% of the legacy longtime employees because of COVID. You know what they did? They didn't work for two years or, or more. So they had to go work at a, at a shopping center or if they were restaurant employees and the restaurants were closed for a year and a half or two, they decided they didn't wanna work the crazy hours and maybe the wages that not were were not enough support their their families. They found other industries. Maybe they went back to university and got a a two year degree, and now they're in the technology world making x amount of of uh, euros a year, dollars a year, whatever the you know the currency is, where they made a third of that when they were helping to build stands and midnight because the show opened at eight o'clock the next morning. So I'll, I'll just say that workforce development in the United States alone in the hospitality industry, which includes restaurants and hotels and meetings and conventions, et cetera, um, there are still, there are still 8 million job openings, 8 million. And the meetings and exhibition business events space, to the best of the research that I have access to, there are still um, 600,000 jobs open. I'm talking about maids. I'm talking about restaurant waiters and waitresses. I'm talking about uh, people working in, you know, my parent company is called Star and uh they they own four companies and they build stands. So where did the carpenters go? Did they go into other areas? Because for years they had great jobs building stands. All these mega wonderful booths that we all see in these big wonderful trade shows and the smaller ones. So anyways, workforce development, I can go on and on and on. There's a lot of opportunities now I was just in Washington, D.C., which is where we have our Legislative Action Day last week. And then Global Exhibitions Day is coming up uh, shortly that uh, UFI sponsors. And trying to educate ladies and gentlemen at the high school level, you know, the grade 8 to 12, depending on who's listening around the world, um, 
as to there's there's a lot of great careers. You know, are you going to be a multimillionaire working in our industry? I've worked in it 48 years. I'm not a multimillionaire, but I've made a good living for my family, my wife and I, three kids and now six grandkids. So when I do retire, I'm blessed. Um, you know, that, that that's the reality. But I started out as a hotel salesperson making $9,000 a year U.S., and now I make a minute, I make a couple dollars more than that. <laughs> but it's also 48 years later. <laughs> so does that help kind of set it up? It's a big challenge. Yeah. But you know what? Workforce development in every industry is a big challenge because people, you know, people decided during the during uh, COVID that they didn't want to work so hard at a lower wage, so they found better jobs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or, or they stop working and they, they depend on their mother and father. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, all of it is possibly the entire range. Uh, depending upon the mindset, people have done all kinds of things. So before we end this, my final question is that if you have to leave exhibitors with one piece of advice, that this is what you guys need to do to ensure that you get the most out of your trade shows, what would that be? Do your research and have honest conversations with the show organizers, understand the demographics of the last three to five years of their show, understand the buying power, understand the, the various titles. We put out a, a prospectus for our show in, in March of 2025. It's at the printer as we speak. We have all kinds of demographics showing how many males, females, their education level, uh, their buying power, their influence, their titles, their products they're looking for, we even asked the question, what company, if you attended the last couple of years, what company did not exhibit and, and list them for us so we can go solicit them and get them to come to our show? Hmm. So data, data, data. And be honest as an exhibitor with your CEO and your CFO. Don't blow up, uh, I call it smoke and mirrors. Don't, don't blow smoke at these ladies or gentlemen that are your bosses. Tell them the truth. If you think you're going to be able to spend 50,000 euros uh, on a particular show and your best guess is you'll generate 10 pieces of business worth uh, um, $1.3 million, show them that you care about spending their money like it, if it were your own money. Sure. And you know what? That builds credibility and it also builds a, a career uh, uh, success. Don't yeah. lie. Tell the truth. And by the way, always under promise, always over deliver. Pitchlink makes buying easy by enabling high quality engagement between buyers and sellers. Through its presentation and discussion modules, sellers create customized sales narratives using sales collaterals and personal videos and reach out to prospects through a non-intrusive buyer qualified engagement process. Pitchlink requires no installation or download, contains and manages the entire repository of sales collaterals and buyer-seller conversations. Talk to us to know more about how you can engage with customers without interruption. Connect with us on LinkedIn or visit tradeshowengage.com that is tradeshowengage.com David, this was wonderful. Uh, thank you again. I'm, I'm so grateful that you came to the show. I, I hope to talk to you again soon and uh, and have a great week. My pleasure and take care and stay healthy. Thank you. We have a fantastic lineup over the next couple of episodes featuring great conversations on engaging your booth visitors and maximizing your ROI from your trade show investments. Subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you do not miss a single episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you for being with us today on the Trade Show Podcast, the podcast of record for the trade show and events industry. Here we talk to movers and shakers of the $50 billion trade show industry and identify ideas, challenges, tactics and strategies to leverage the first party intent inherent in the trade show business. We hope this conversation helped inform and motivate as we all navigate a rapidly changing business environment. For us, these are enlightening conversations enriched with knowledge and expertise. We encourage you to go out and implement some of the ideas we discussed today. 
we hope to have you with us again in the next exciting episode of the trade show podcast if you liked what you heard subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast platform like itunes google play spotify or wherever else you get your podcast from and give us a rating while you are at it this is a biscast original podcast and is produced for pitchlink the next generation visitor engagement platform where our mission is to make buying easy hosted by shubhanjan sarkar and produced by rajiv aditya see you next time and have a wonderful day